today we're making an interesting special. It's a savory pastry. It's made with a flavor that's very traditional to Amanda's family. It's zata. There's different variants of it. This one, uh, the core ingredient is sesame seeds, um, some toasted sesame seeds with thyme, sumac, and salt. Now I'm gonna mix it with extra virgin olive oil to a one-to-one -one ratio. So I'm just weighing out the zata on a scale. And for now, I'll just mix a little bit of this can. So I've weighed out 200 grams of the zata. I'm gonna tear my scale and add the same amount of weight in olive oil. This is another example of how useful scales are. I, I suppose you could measure these things a number of ways. I've said this a lot of times, you know, the scales are just a really great way of preparing anything uh, and, and of course baking in general. I can't imagine working without the scale system. So really I'm just stirring these two ingredients together now to form a paste. And I've come up with that one-to-one -one ratio. We're just looking for a texture that's a, a bit spreadable, similar to how we make other, other types of pinwheels. We're looking for, for that paste. You don't want a situation where you have a lot of dry, powdery herbs. And you don't want a situation where you have more oil uh, that can't really be absorbed. And that's really all there is to it. It's nice to add another savory option on the menu. We've had the salted rosemary twist uh, on the menu as a staple for years. One of the reasons I love sourdough croissant dough as much as I do is that it's not overly sweet. You can put a savory application on it. You can put a sweeter filling, like say our uh, morning buns, which are like a cinnamon roll. Very similar overall process. They're both pinwheels. They're both rolled up very similarly. The dough can be the same, the filling changes, and the entire experience is a different one. So we'll take a look at the final product a little bit later. We've got some sourdough croissant dough to make. So today we're making the Zatar pinwheels and we're starting the process in day two of a three-day croissant uh, dough process. Day two is after having mixed the croissant dough, bulk fermented it, stretched it into sheets, chilled it, and so we have two sheets of croissant dough here on this uh, sheet tray, and it's uh, combining with our lamination butter. This is definitely an upgrade since the last time I did uh, any kind of lamination on film, because the last time I did this, we were still using blocks of butter and making them into croissant sheets. We had the ability to upgrade our butter supply. Butter's not something that uh, is as robust of food and of itself uh, in the US uh, as it is in other parts of the world. Like when you think of France, you often think of butter. Certainly there's some good sources of butter in the US too, but other parts of the world like really take this seriously where you, you can go down a main street of a city center and still see stores that just make butter uh, fresh. You don't really see that very often uh, around, around the US. So we're getting butter uh, imported that's already ready for lamination. And it's a really high quality butter, better than I could buy uh, domestically. You can even see by the color. Uh, it's just got this beautiful kind of yellowish color to it that's a nice sign of uh, of high quality. This butter is at the right temperatures, so I can tell by touch. Uh, and that temperature usually is around 60 degrees. It's coupling with cold dough. And the cold dough is a really important element because as I stretch this out through the sheeter, what's going to end up happening is the butter is going to warm with the friction of the sheeter, and the dough is going to keep it chilled at that same constant range where it's pliable and spreadable, won't crack and won't melt. That's the, the really difficult uh, aspect of, of lamination in particular is that you're trying to prevent those two things from happening. You're trying to prevent it from being so cold that it cracks or so warm that it melts. And your, your actual forgiveness factor there is somewhat low. You can see that this is just 
in addition to being a higher quality butter for us, it's a massive, massive savings in time for our most expensive input, which of course is uh, human labor. So now we can pull from the fridge these sheets, we can get them to the right temperature as we're ready to uh, laminate and just put them together with our, our dough sheets. So I'm starting on the thickest setting. The biggest risk to my lamination right off the bat is because of the shape and size of these sheets, the dough sheets themselves can't be stretched out to a full sheet pan. They're a little bit narrower, and as a result, they're a little thicker. And so my biggest risk in the whole process is this first one, this first pass where my sheet is very thick. Went through it just fine. And so now that I've actually passed through the rollers, I know I'm going to have a decent amount of success through the process. Uh, my first aim is to get this uh, particular block to be about the width of the sheeter, which is kind of a common theme through this process. That's usually at about a level of 21 on my roller here, which uh, indicates thickness. So now I'm going to rotate. And you can see that my sheet is roughly the width of the device. And now I'm going to take it down all the way to 8. And so when I'm saying these numbers, 0 to 30 is my range. The smaller the number, the closer the wheels of the rolling pin are together. And, uh, and so I'm basically thinning the croissant dough and stretching it. So with each pass, it's getting longer now. And now I'm down to a 12. So I'm actually going to pass it all the way through without flattening it and finish it on this side at the final thickness for this part of the, the process. I've created a lot of tension stretching it. So the first thing I'm going to do is gently release some of that tension. The tension actually keeps through the process. If I don't release the tension, I'm just adding more and more tension over time. And so uh, then I'm going to have that snapback effect of a rubber band sometime during the process. In order to now finish, I want to cut my sheet even to the butter line. So if there's any piece that's not, that I can tell doesn't have butter, I'm cutting that out. This one was pretty even. You can still see butter in this. I'm just mostly cutting it uh, for, for the evenness sake. And I would do the same thing on the edges. So if I noticed that there was a big thick piece of dough on the edge that didn't have butter, then I would trim that. Although I really don't have that here. I have a pretty nice even sheet. And so I'm going to fold it over into uh, what we call a book fold. On this side, however, I have more of a triangle shape. The butter is spread throughout. I'm going to cut this end into strips and now fold it over into my book fold. So this is the first step of the book fold. So I get this far. I can also examine the edges and see where my butter line is. I can literally feel it. The butter has a has like a harder consistency. So I can feel that there's butter and then I can feel that it breaks right here. And the rest of this is just pure dough. Uh, what I can do to not lose this dough is trim the end. So I basically cut out what is just dough. There's no butter in it. Uh, at the edge here, now I already have butter. I've created a sandwich, one layer of dough, one layer of butter, one layer of dough. I have folded it together. And so now actually in this stage, I've got dough, butter, dough, another dough, which will just fuse together as one layer, butter, dough. So I'm going to do the same kind of work here on the edge and just cut off anything that isn't laminated. And so now I have these scraps and what to do with these scraps. There's really no reason to lose them because for the most part, this is just dough. And if I put it on this top layer and continue to laminate, it's going to thin out. 
and it will just become a layer of dough in my block. I, if I chuck this dough right now, I'm just putting valuable croissant dough that we've bulk fermented, we've spent a lot on the ingredients and the labor into the garbage can uh, when it could still produce really nice croissants. So now I have my first level of lamination. This is a book fold. So I've taken the book and closed it. If I was to store this dough, if it was too warm, meaning if my butter was going to start to melt right now, I would indent it once, put it in the fridge, wait 30 minutes, let the butter cool down a little, and then move on to layer two. What we decided though a long time ago was that our dough is cold enough and pliable enough to go through the second fold process right off the bat. And so I'm gonna go through that really quick. It's only gonna take a minute. Same concept here. I'm going to stretch it out to the width. Rotate it. Now bring it down further. And I'm ending at the number nine because I know that when I do my letter fold this time at the number nine, I'm still going to be able to fit the dough on a tray. So now I'm no longer worried about trimmings because I've got those taken care of in the first fold. Releasing tension and I'm gonna do a letter fold. So that's third of the way. I'm going into thirds. So there is my second fold. I'm gonna indent it twice to let anyone in the facility know that this sheet is not fully laminated, it's two thirds of the way. And I'll give you guys a look at the layers, which are usually the worst at the edges, but you can see after two folds, that's the layering of dough, butter, dough, butter. So now you can see a lot more layers in there uh, of dough, butter, dough, butter. I've literally multiplied by three. And I will do this one more time to get to my final sheet of croissant dough. But if I do it too early, the butter is going to start to melt on me. So I need to throw this block into the fridge now for about 30 minutes and I can address it any time between 30 minutes from now and let's say a few hours if need be. All right, so my dough now has cooled down. The butter is nice and firm again, so I'm not gonna risk melting it. Going to my third fold, so I have two indents here telling me that it's the second fold. I need to finish out the lamination now. So I'll create all the remaining layers that there are and still have a block, which will then cool down until we're ready to roll out. At that point, we can pass it through the sheeter, get it down to its uh, thinnest with all 81 layers and be able to roll out the Zatar pinwheels. So as per usual, I'm going to do pretty much an identical workflow to what I did on the second fold. I stretch out the sheets to when I flip it, it's going to be about the width of the belt. If you're looking really closely, you can probably notice that the overall sheet's just a little crisper uh, and straighter and, and it's because there's more layers and more tension built up uh, between the layers like that. The whole thing is just stiffer and so it goes through the sheeter a lot smoother. Smoother than my sheeter sounding these days. There's something going on that I, I need to grease it. I need to just take a look at it. So I'm gonna finish off at a level eight. And now I'm gonna indent three times. For the sake of consistency, I'll trim off the edge and here. This is the fully laminated amount of layers right here. So you can see all of them. Now this is going to get rolled thin on the next full rollout and go on the table. Uh, I'll scan everything, I'll hold it.
holler at you when I'm done. All right, cool. Yeah, yeah I'll be at the fish for a few minutes. I gotta move, spread down the pallet and all that stuff. So no problem. Let's know before I leave. Really looking forward to having a warehouse for the sake of dealing with something that I think every single kitchen in you know the country and probably around the world deals with is just constant irregular interruptions with deliveries. It's a real luxury, you could say, a privilege to get to a point that you have a location that's dedicated to this. Uh, you know, nowadays we get such a large volume of ingredients. Uh, you know, we're getting like a pallet of butter right now. This croissant dough has rested. We've gone through the lamination process and now we're going to roll out the za'atar pinwheels with it. At this point, it's gotten its three sets of folds to create all 81 layers of dough, butter, dough, butter, dough, butter. And in the process, uh, the whole team is laminating the day sheets. So you can see various stages right now. We have just a sheet of croissant dough nestled atop of another sheet of croissant dough, butter that's waiting in the wings to laminate. We've got a sheet here that's gotten uh, two sets of folds, so it's been indented twice. Uh, another one that's gotten two. In the fridge, we have more that have gotten three. This sheet's complete, so I'm going to go ahead and get it set for the creation of these Zata pinwheels. And just to give you a peek of what this dough looks like, all the layers of butter and dough are extremely prominent. This one block now gets flattened out into a sheet. So all the layers that you see here, of course, I've got a pretty thick sheet, so I'm going to now take it through the, the sheeter to thin it out. First step is just passing it through and seeing how it does. And now what I'm trying to do is stretch the sheet out to the width of the belt. There is an at-home variation to this and it's the rolling pin. This is like a, I guess you could call it like a very sophisticated rolling pin. And we're making a lot of these. If you laminated a lot less at home, then you would have a block of dough that still is small enough to manipulate by hand. I have this little dial here which measures the millimeters of space between my two rollers. So right now I'm at a 12, so that represents 12 millimeters of space between my rollers. Actually a lot of people that train here don't see this at first because you can barely make it out, but that is, the, that is where it's set. So right now it's set to a number 12 setting on this particular scale. 30 being the largest opening between these rollers. So if I open this guy up, that's the maximum distance that I'm gonna get between the two rollers. And as I close the dial down, the rollers get closer and closer together. And I'm gonna take this one down all the way to a five. My final pastries, each of them have a uh, slightly different end point. So like uh, the DNA chocolatines end at an eight and different pastries end at, at a different um, final thickness. And that's based on trial and error of proofing these things and deciding how big of a final pastry do we want to produce. The thinner you go, the longer your sheet is, the more individual pastries you can create. Of course, they're only going to rise to a certain degree as well. And so we're balancing between the final product size versus the thickness on the, on the roller. And as I go down, uh, I can make these smaller and smaller. Meanwhile, my sheet is getting longer and longer. I've got this little trick up my sleeve. I'm gonna put this rolling pin down. I find this to be very satisfying. Roll it once around, and then let it catch on those catches. So now I've got this fully rolled up sheet, which we're gonna take to the table and make uh, the Zata pinwheels with. 
So I've got my final uh, rollout of the Zatar pinwheels. I'm going to unroll it on the table. And I'm actually unrolling it in reverse because this particular side of my sheet is just a little less pretty. So I've got a nice smooth side here. And that will be my outer layer of my pinwheel. And this side is, is OK, but it was my dry side. So the dough had a little bit of dryness on top. And you can see the texture uh, as we rolled it out that there's still some dryness. That dough is going to rehydrate itself through the moisture of the rest of the, the dough over the course of the proofing process. It's better for it to be on the inside where it can do that, whereas on the outside it might maintain that, that little bit of dryness texture. Now I'm unstretching the sheet because what's happened is I've stretched it out on that sheeter and created tension. It's kind of like pulling a rubber band. Well, if you pull a rubber band too much, what happens? It springs back. Same thing here. If I don't stretch it the opposite way, then my sheet is going to spring back on itself as I go to make uh, these pinwheels. So next step in the process is just taking this paste that we made and spreading it over what's going to be the inside of the final pastry. And my guess I'm going to need most of this, but I'm going to give it a spread first and then decide how much more to add. What's nice about this spice blend, or I suppose not nice, if you do it wrong, is uh, it packs a lot of flavor. So a little goes a long way. I'm just trying to create a nice thin layer of even coating, and that's all you need. You don't have to cake this, this uh, stuff on. Zata is hard to pinpoint a similarity to other than the, the kind of mixture of ingredients like the sesame and the thyme. You know, if you are very familiar with each of those individual flavors, then you might be able to imagine the combination. But the combination itself is quite unique. It's definitely very herby uh, and a bit earthy. It's got its own thing going on. And so you can't like say, oh, it's, it's a lot like this or a lot like that. It's really, it, it really is a spice blend that deserves its own name uh, because it, it's, fairly a, it's a fairly unique flavor profile. And perhaps it's not for everybody, uh, this flavor profile, in the sense that if you're unfamiliar with it, maybe it would be more of an acquired taste. Although I think it becomes a little bit more universal especially when paired with a balancing yogurt. The overall flavor of the spices is going to have kind of a herb forward uh, flavor and, and even a bit of salt that both comes from the spice blend itself and the saltiness of the, the oil. The lebne, uh, as mentioned, strained yogurt, we actually use it in place of cream cheese in our house because we find it to be just superior in, in most ways. The lebne is a really nice balancer in flavor, and so these can be served with a little dollop of the, of the lebne for maximum effect. I have the amount of zata that I did on here, and I'm just spreading it thin into layers, and this is all that is necessary. I might not even need any more. For this, I'm just using one of the plastic dough scrapers. It's, in my opinion, an essential tool for a baker to have at their disposal because it functions like a handheld spatula. So I'm just going to take the extra time here to get a more even spread. Some of you might recognize this as the method of making cinnamon rolls. I'm basically folding over that layer that was clean for the first layer. And I'm going to do the same from the top. From here, once I have the first layer formed, my job is just to roll it up and keep it somewhat tight as I do. So I've got two halves, two distinct pinwheels now. And I'm going to cut that middle to separate the 
two halves from each other. So I've got my bicicleta. It's uh, measured out to two and a half inch uh, intervals. And I'm now going to just simply mark my dough so I know where to cut. You don't have to use a pizza cutter for this if you don't want to. I think it provides nice clean edges, but you could cut with a chef's knife. You could cut with a bench knife, I suppose. I just have a need for the pizza wheel in the other processes, and so it works well enough for the application. Your dough might be a little bit more delicate. It might not be quite as chilled. I know I struggled with that in the garage environment where my environment just wasn't as well temperature controlled. My refrigeration, which was uh, literally homemade, uh, didn't work quite as effectively as the commercial walk-in does. And so when the dough is warmer, in particular, it's not as, uh, it's not as forgiving as when it's colder. And so you might opt for a chef knife at, at that point to get a cleaner cut if you've got more delicate dough. I'm now gonna take sheet trays and arrange these in 12s. Probably notice I'm giving them a light press and also tucking that tail so that during the baking process, the tail doesn't completely unfurl, but rather hugs the pastry. The amount of pastries you can put on a sheet tray, you know, depend on your final result. And so 12 is a nice safe number where we know that these will not end up interfering with one another. So one sheet of this uh, croissant dough is roughly seven kilos of dough plus the butter that we add to it. And that one sheet, so far I've got two trays of 12, so 24. So 60 even uh, pinwheels from that one sheet. The cost of producing these is, as you can imagine, quite high. Uh, we are always nowadays, when we make videos, not always, but oftentimes we're missing some important elements of, uh, of the timing that it takes. And even on a longer video, if you've watched any of our longer segments, you see maybe an hour of footage, but you see an hour of footage that actually takes multiple days of process. So to make this croissant dough, the first day is mixing and uh, bulk fermentation, of course. Uh, the, the ingredients themselves are about as expensive as you can get. Uh, there's close to, I think, 40% or so baker's percentage in butter alone uh, in the dough. And butter is no inexpensive ingredient, especially these days. We use organic flour in our products. And so day one is mixing, bulk fermenting, then stretching out the croissant dough to get it ready for lamination and chilling. There's two different temperature controls on the first day. You have to have the first process start warm uh, in order to do the bulk fermentation properly, uh, mid 80s but then the dough has to be chilled prior to lamination. We go about lamination as though it's no big deal anymore because we have systems. But when we started, all of these individual variables had to be trial and aired for many, many months to figure out the exact system and order of operations, the exact temperature that the doughs need to be, that the butter needs to be, in order to actually produce laminated dough. So day two comes around, or I suppose really much later on day one, after the stretched out bulk fermented sheets of croissant have time to chill all the way to refrigerated temperatures, we combine them with warm butter. 
And by warm butter, I don't mean 70 degree butter, I actually mean 60 degree butter. So it has to be cold at first and just barely thaw to where it's starting to become pliable. There's only about a five degree temperature range that the butter can be at its starting position in order for you to be able to roll it out through the sheeter without cracking it or melting it uh, and to get even layers of croissant dough. That, that five degree range is say 58 uh, degrees Fahrenheit to 63. Some butters, depending on where you're sourcing your butter, might tolerate a slightly warmer temperature by a few degrees. Some butters might tolerate a slightly colder temperature. We've learned that over the years where we've tried different butters and have had to do different things. Anyway, you get the butter, get it to 60 degrees, and now you have refrigerated dough and just somewhat thawed butter going into the lamination process, which is what, we're, uh, what we uh, then need to do on day two. Uh, once laminated, uh, we can do the rollout. And before this product comes to life, it still has a full shift, uh, nearly eight hours, uh, sometimes longer, uh, in, the, in the proofing environment before it goes to bake. So we often will laminate on day two, roll out, bring the products to our walk-in, let them cool down a little, come to a temperature stable uh, moment. You could go directly to the proofer from the table, uh, although if you're making a lot of pastries, like we have all of these ready to go. So suppose I rolled these somewhat warm uh, pastries that are room temperature into the proofer and coupled them with um, cold ones. The cold ones are going to proof a little bit slower than the ones that are already at ambient temperature. And so that's another important consideration why proofing in, or refrigerating in between makes a lot of sense. So we refrigerate in between on day two and then day three is when we pull out the croissant dough throw it in the proofer uh, all day, then egg wash it, then bake it, then there might even be a topping component for some of them, and then finally, after three days worth of work, uh, you have your final uh, croissant product. Beautifully summarized in our, in our videos into whatever length, uh, ranging from a few minutes to maybe, uh, maybe a couple hours in a shot. Eight of these Lebnes. We really like Lebne. My wife introduced me many years ago. Oh, really? So I'm not the first one to come in and buy a huge amount. I never use uh, cream cheese anymore, you know, like uh, if we ever have like bagels at home or something, always Lebne, not cream cheese. Lebne jam and uh, toast, it's very good. Thank you so much. That's it. So I have the one that I like. This is, uh, this one's traditional Lebanese mix. And it's a little bit different than the one that we used today, which was all we had. It still has the same ingredients, but they're blended, I think, in slightly different ratios. So I'm gonna argue that tomorrow's Zatar pinwheels will be even better. Thank you. try the Zata pinwheel with the Lebne. Uh, I never tried the seasoning before. Oh yeah, until uh, like, like yesterday was your first time ever trying it. 
So it's a very herby and savory flavor. And the Lebne does a really good job to like balance, balance it out. And you can see the texture of the Lebne. It's uh, very fluffy and stiff. Uh, once you try this, in my opinion, cream cheese is just not very appealing anymore. I'm not gonna lie, I had some cream cheese recently. But most of the time, I choose Lebne because it's, it's got a really nice flavor to it and, and an equally nice texture. So here we go. I like it. You like the balance of that? Mm -hmm. The za'atar has like an herby taste to it, and the lebne gives it just the right balance so you don't get the, um, it's not so salty, which otherwise, I mean, some people really just love the za'atar on its own. But I think the lebne brings it to another uh, layer. So we're going to be selling these pinwheels here with, uh, with little side dishes of lebne uh, and people can enjoy both and have a nice savory treat. So, Zata pinwheels. <laughs>